Welcome to the part four of the training entitled Mapping Crops and Their Biophysical Characteristics with Polarimetric Synthetic Aperture Radar and Optical Remote Sensing. My name is Pierre de Fourny, professor at UC Louvain in Belgium, and with my colleagues from the European Space Agency, Fabrizio Ramoino, we will have the pleasure to introduce you to the crop-specific time series analysis for growth monitoring. This session is the last one of a sequence of four sessions talking about SAR polarimetry for agriculture, practical on polarimetry, and then introducing also the send for start open source toolbox. Today, by the end of this training, you will learn what is the time series of satellite multispectral reflectance and how to prepare such a time series using SNAP toolbox. You will learn how to retrieve the livery index from an optical time series and how to control the quality of this time series. Finally, we will see how to exploit in a crop specific manner the LAI time series at regional level, as well as to assess the inter and intra parcel heterogeneity of all corn fields in a given region. The session is structured in three main parts. First, Fabrizio Ramorino will introduce you to the pre-processing of optical time series and on the retrieval of Levi-Rear index from the Sentinel-2 using the SNAP toolbox. I will then, through a Jupyter notebook, introduce you to a practical exercise to analyze in a crop-specific manner the leave area index time series for growth monitoring. We will then conclude with a section four made of question and answer. As you know, since decades, the NDVI, the Normalized Difference Vegetation Index, allowed to monitor the greenness of the vegetation along the season. Time series analysis for crop growth monitoring is not new, but today, we rather prefer to look at crop traits or crop biophysical variables, which are typically key indicators of the vegetation development. For instance, the leaf area index, also called green area index, is a key indicator to assess over time the development of the vegetation. On the left side, you can see a temporal profile along the season showing the green biomass increase uh, with the development of the crop. On the left side, you can see for a given parcel, the heterogeneity intra-parcel level, showing the different value for each pixel of these parcels and the different value of LAI in this case. Unlike the NDVI, the leave area index can be measured on the ground and is a meaningful variable for crop growth model, for instance. It is measured, for instance, from digital hemispherical photograph process using a CANI software, which allow to estimate at the best possible the leave area index, which is observed on the ground. When it comes to satellite remote sensing, there are two ways to estimate the leave area index. On one side, we can use empirical regression between ground observation and spectral signature from the satellite observation, and to develop a local model which allows to estimate from the satellite observation a leave area index estimation. At the opposite, we have developed as a community an approach which is much more physically based, providing a model which can be transferred from one place to another and which can be applied from one year to another. To do so, we base the approach on a radiative transfer model which mimic the physics of the electromagnetic properties of the different surface interacting with the sunlight. For instance, at leaf level, the prospect radiative transfer model 
is a major a major uh, achievement to simulate the behavior of a leaf with regard to the sunlight. The leaf is made of a structure of different layers, and for each layer, we have defined different electromagnetic properties interacting with the sunlight. For instance, the layer with containing the chlorophylls will actually absorb a lot of the red light to do the photosynthesis, while the structure of the mesophyll will interact with the near infrared providing a large reflectance in the near infrared bands. The prospect bundle allowed to simulate the spectral signature of a leaf based on its biochemical component as well as based on its structure. As you can understand, this prospect model will be used to actually describe the behavior of each leaf of a macroscopic canopy. Indeed, from this leaf model, we will build a macroscopic model to mimic the behavior of a canopy with regard to the sunlight. To do so, we have to define crop structural parameters like the leaf area index, the density of the plant, the clumping effect describing the aggregation of the different leaves around the stem, and so on. In addition, the optical properties of each of these components will be described based on the prospect radiative model. By doing so, we have prepared a numerical model of the vegetation at canopy level. Then we can eliminate the canopy using the sunlight and see how much of this sunlight is absorbed, how much of this sunlight is transmit, and how much of this sunlight is reflected to the observing instrument. This is done for the different wavelengths, providing a simulated reflectance for all the spectral bands which are typically observed by satellite observation. Additionally, we can play different sun angle, sun zenith angle, and sun azimuth angle will define the bio bidirectional reflectance distribution, which allow to mimic the surface reflectance for the different position of the sun. Similarly, the viewing geometry, knowing the viewing uh, angle of the instrument, will define how this uh, situation is observed by the remote sensing instrument. Therefore, we have on one side the leaf area index, which allow to define the microscopic uh, model. And on the other side, we have simulated reflectance, which can be used to retrieve the LAI estimation. To do so, we will use a neural network to allow to move from the leaf area index to the reflectance level. By doing so, we will build a model which can relate the leaf area index value to the spectral signature in the different wavelengths. We will invert this model to make sure that we can do the opposite from the simulated reflectance value we can retrieve the LAI, which was initially defined for the macroscopic model. On the upper corner, you can see how well the model has been trained and how much the green area index, which has been initially used in the model, can be estimated from the simulated reflectance. Once this calibration has been completed successfully, we can then use this model, which has been trained on a numerical model, to be, uh, to be applied to the actual observation as recorded by the satellite. Therefore, we will invert this neuronal network model to retrieve 
the library index for each pixel which has been observed by the satellite. This allows to provide maps of library index from a multispectral observation dataset. It still remains to validate this inversion of the model, and to do so, we will have a set of ground observations which are precisely measured on the ground and simultaneously observed from satellite. The correlation between the green or the library index estimation with the ground measure uh, green area index or library index observation show that the performance is quite high with, with a rune mean square error of 0.7. This allows to use this model to convert any optical time series into a live area index time series. Once you have the live area index time series, you can analyze it to derive the vegetation productivity. Indeed, the evolution of the live area index allow to depict a set of variables related to the vegetation productivity and to the vegetation phenology. We can look at the start of the vegetation. This would be the A value or the end of the growing cycle. It would be the B value or the length, which is the interval between both, or the minimum, which is the bare soil LAI value or the peak of the season, which will be a variable that we will derive in the section three of this training. The amplitude is, the, of course, the range of the LAI value, here corresponding to F. And then we will use also in our section three uh, exercise, the large integrated value corresponding to the area under the curve of the LAI profile over the season. This area under the curve, here in grey and, and blue, correspond to the vegetation productivity. Before looking at do this uh, variable to relate to the crop growing cycle, I will leave the floor to Fabrizio Ramonigno to introduce you to the pre-processing and the SNAP toolbox. Welcome everybody, my name is Fabrizio Ramoino. I work in ISA ESRIN since 2011 as optical and thermal data exploitation expert. And I would like to present to you how to process Sentinel-2 data using ISA SNAP software in order to retrieve biophysical variables and radiometric indices for vegetation. To account for atmospheric effect, we need to pre-process the optical data. We need to apply atmospheric correction to take into account gases and particles present in the atmosphere that can affect the incoming radiation, and we need to compensate this effect. Optical data preprocessing includes also cloud detection and cloud removal algorithms. Other preprocessing steps that may be needed to apply are the reprojection, resampling, and co registration. For further analysis, we want to use a surface reflectance product in order to allow comparison between images, allow repeatable measurements, repeat a no physical unit. For this reason, to retrieve surface reflectance, we need to add back the component lost in the atmosphere. The other preprocessing steps are the reprojection, if the input of the time series comes from several sources with different coordinate reference system, the reprojection to a common coordinate reference system is needed. Resampling data coming from different sources could have different spatial resolution. Therefore, in this case, before analyzing the time series, a resample is necessary. There are different methods to apply the resample, uh, the most common uh, are the nearest neighbor, the bilinear interpolation, and cubic convolution. Co-registration, in order to maximize the geolocation accuracies in time series analysis, the co-registration is needed. 
especially if you work with uh, very high resolution and high resolution data. Why use time series? A time series is defined as a set of satellite images taken over the same area of interest at different time. And it can make use of different satellite sources to obtain a larger data series with short term interval. Time series of satellite observation offer opportunities for understanding how Earth is changing, for determining the causes of these changes, and for predicting future changes. Now I would like to show you a great example of optical high resolution satellite which is the Sentinel-2 Copernicus Optical High Resolution Mission, which is used for monitoring land and coastal regions. On board it has a multispectral instrument, which means that it registers incoming radiation in multiple spectral bands. We have 13 bands, 4 bands at 10 meters, blue, green, red and near infrared. We have 6 bands at 20 meter resolution, two bands in the short wave infrared, three bands in the red age between red and near infrared, and after we have a narrow band in the near infrared. On top of it, we have three bands at 60 meters, and the, these bands are mainly used for the atmospheric and cirrus correction. If you compare Sentinel-2 to Landsat, the difference is bands that Sentinel-2 operates in uh, uh, red age but we missed the thermal bands which are present in Landsat. The spatial resolution of Landsat is 30 meters and the revisit time is 16 days. The revisit time of Sentinel-2 at the equator is 5 days with two satellites, Sentinel-2A and 2B, that are in the same orbit. Here we can see the map of Sentinel-2 coverage so practically you see that we have whole land and coastal areas covered by Sentinel-2 systematic image acquisitions, even the islands. We have two levels of Sentinel-2 product, level 1C and level 2A, distributed by 100 km by 100 km granules, which are the minimum indivisible parts of the product. These products are distributed free of charge and free and open mode through Copernicus Open HS Hub. Level 1C is the top of atmosphere reflectance in cartographic geometry, and level 2A is the bottom of atmosphere reflectance in cartographic geometry. So the Sentinel 2A level 2A data are atmospherically corrected. The atmospheric correction is performed by using a processor called Sentucor. This processor is the one used in the ESA payload data ground segment, but it's also available for the users. The Sentucor is distributed via STEP, Scientific Toolbox Exploitation Platform, and it can be used as plugin in SNAP software or via command line a standalone tool. The output of sent to core is the bottom of atmosphere reflectance in cartographic geometry, but also we have as output a scene classification map that contains basic land cover layers, including clouds. We have a water vapor map and aerosol optical thickness map. Apart from sent to core, Sentinel-2 data can be atmospherically corrected using other different processor, depending on your application. For instance, we have Maya, LASRC, ICOR, and CORA, and many other. Here we have the example of Level 1C and Level 2A Sentinel-2 data. On the left, you see Level 1C product, the top of atmosphere product, and on the right, you have the atmospherically corrected product, Level 2A. You can see on the left the RGB natural color combination for Level 1C, and on the right, the same RGB combination for level 2A after the atmospheric correction. You have also, as mentioned before, the scenes classification map, the water vapor map, and the optical thickness map. Sentinel-2 data can be used for various applications, like land cover classification, 
agriculture, forest and vegetation monitoring, water quality, coastal zone and bathymetry, regional to urban application, geology and many other. Going a bit deeper into data processing and how multispectral data can be used to monitor vegetation and crops, one of the main methods used for monitoring vegetation but also soil, water, are radiometric indices. The radiometric indices are quantitative measures of features that are obtained directly by remote sensing data by combining several spectral bands. If you want to retrieve information about physical features of canopy, we can use so-called biophysical variables. The biophysical variables are not derived directly from remote sensing data, but auxiliary information are needed. There are several of them, but the ones which are more important for crops are, for example, leaf area index, FAPAR, fractional vegetation cover, chlorophyll content in the leaf, and canopy water content. In the second part of the webinar, I will show you how to retrieve these variables using ISA-SNAP software. In this image, you can see which biophysical variables can be used uh, for monitoring certain features of crops. For instance, for monitoring uh, phenology, as a first choice, you would use leaf area index and as secondary measures, you could use FAPAR and FCOVER to complete the information. The same if you want to see the impact of pests on crop, you also use leaf area index. Now, after this short optical remote sensing refresher, we would like to present the ESA SNAP software, which can be very useful to process optical imagery, but only optical, even radar and thermal data. SNAP is an acronym for Sentinel Application Platform, even if it can be used not only for Sentinel, but also for the data coming from other satellites. The software is free and open source, built in common Java framework. In SNAP is also possible to include your own Python plugin, apart from the functionalities already provided in the software. It has an intuitive graphical user interface. There is an online help with many tutorials and even a very active forum where you can discuss with user and also developers of SNAP. It's possible to download SNAP software freely from step.isa.int. Here we have some statistics. Recently SNAP reached almost 960,000 downloads and on STEP, we have more than 1,500,000 visit sessions since June 2015. STEP is the ISA community platform where you can access the software, download documentation, and communicate with developers and expert users. Welcome to everybody to the second part of the webinar focused on the introduction to ISA SNAP software and how to use it to pre-process and process Sentinel-2 data in order to retrieve biophysical variables and radiometric indices for crop monitoring. SNAP is the acronym for Sentinel Application Platform, but as already said before, it's a multi-mission free and open source software. In fact, we have a lot of readers dedicated to optical sensors Sentinel-2, Sentinel-3, but also ISA TPM and commercial satellites like Landsat, Pleiad, RapidEye and many other. We have also readers dedicated to SAR sensors, Sentinel-1 and um, Heritage mission from ISA like Envisat, IRS and also TPM data like Carlos Pulsar and uh, Cosmos SkyMed. So let's go to open a Sentinel-2 product. 
File, Import, Optical Sensors, Sentinel-2, Level-2A. Two Here there is the product, we open and we select the XML file at the import product. From the name of the product we can get some information, like which satellite acquired the image, in this case Sentinel 2A, which processing level and in this case is level 2A, and we have the date and time of the acquisition. And after we have the Sentinel-2 tile ID that identify the tile of Sentinel-2 that are 100 km by 100 km in UTM WGS84 coordinate reference system. Let's go inside the file. We have the metadata where we can find information about the product, general info, geometric info, auxiliary data info. We have the Sentinel-2 bands. In level 2A we don't have band 10 because it's used only for atmospheric correction purposes and is not in the output of the level 2A processor, sent to core. We have the 10 meters bands, band 2, 3, 4 and 8. We have the 20 meters band that are red, the red age bands 5, 6 and 7 the narrow band in the near infrared, band 8A, and two square bands, band 11 and band 12, that are very sensitive to hot surfaces. The last bands of the products are the one related to the scene classification map. It's a set of masks reporting basic uh, land cover layers like vegetated, no vegetated, water, snow and ice and water, but also it contains masks related to cloud probability, cloud shadow, thin clouds, classified pixel, no data pixel and saturated pixel as well. You can use this information to detect and remove no usable pixels, the one that you don't want to use, to use in your processing. Now we can open the product, we can select the product, right click and open RGB image window. We have different uh, RGB image combination for Sentinel-2, natural color, false color infrared, atmospheric penetration, we are going to use the natural color. For the red we have band 4, for the green band 3 and for blue band 2. This is a Sentinel-2 product, it's 100 km by 100 km. On bottom right of the screen we have the pixel position x and y and the coordinates lat long for each pixel. On the left part of the screen we have the navigation window where we can move the visualized window. We have the color manipulation tool using the, it we can stretch the histogram we have the world view that show the footprint of the open product. In this case, we selected a product over Belgium. On top bar, we have several tools. We have the analysis tools where we you can find the correlative plot, scatter plot, profile plot, histogram statistics. We have a layer manager and editor, vector manager and editor, raster functionalities, 
Bad math, using it, the user can edit his own equation and create a new band in the product. DM tools, we have geometric, where there are some pre-processing tools like reprojection, resampling, co-registration, co-location. We have mask tools, data conversion, image analysis, classification processors, unsupervised and supervised classification with the most common classifiers, segmentation processor and export processor. Here we have the tools and functionalities dedicated to optical. We have several processors for Sentinel-2 and Sentinel-3, the pre-processing tools and the thematic land, cover, land processing, biophysical processor to retrieve biophysical variables from Sentinel-2 and Landsat-8, three families of radiometric indices, one for soil, the other for vegetation, the last one for water, We have the Sanity, that is a, a plugin for to calculate the evap evapotranspiration from Sentinel-2 to Sentinel-3. And we have the Forest Cover Change Processor. We have also tools for radar, for interferometry and other SAR application. Under tools, we have the Graph Builder, use it to generate and build your own processing chain to run it on a single image or using it on a batch processing tool to run it on a stack of images. We have the plugin manager to manage or, uh, and install all the available plugins for Snap including your own one. At the end we have window. On the right part of the screen we have the product library. Using, using it, you can download directly the data. There are several repositories from where to download the data, Sentinel-1, Sentinel-2, Sentinel-3. We have the layer manager. You can import your layers just clicking on the plus sign here. And you as you can see, several data formats uh, are allowed, shapefile, RGB, image from file and other. We have the mask manager. Here you have all the masks included in the product and you can create your mask clicking on the function icon and edit your own expression. So now let's go to the first step of the pre-processing, the resampling. As said before, in Sentinel-2 we have bands at different spatial resolution and if you want to combine or work with bands at different spatial resolution, you need to resample them. Click raster, geometric, resampling. And we start to set up the module. Here we have our input and the resampling parameter. If you don't know how to set up these parameters for each of the SNAP module, we have the help in which you can find a brief description of the algorithm of the tool and for some of them you will find how to set up properly the parameters. For resampling, we have three options to resample the product. By reference band, SNAP takes a spatial resolution, the resolution of the reference band. If you want to resample a 10 meter, you have to select or band 2, 3, 4, or 8. By target width and date, and by pixel resolution. If you want to resample a 10 meter, you, you should insert 10 meter here 
and you can define the upsampling method. We live near East Nebo. We don't save the product in order to save time. And the default output for Snap is beam dmap format. We click on run and the product has been generated. The next step is the reprojection. So we select the second product, raster, geometric, reprojection. We don't select save as. In the reprojection parameter, we have a lot of coordinate reference system. In this case, we want to reproject the Sentinel-2 data from UTM WGS84 to geographic LATLON WGS84 and preserve the resolution. We run and the product uh, has been displayed here. The next step is the subset. In order to speed up the processing, we are going to subset uh, uh, the image over our area of interest. So select the last product, raster and subset. We have the window, so you can resize to subset the product. You can resize the window to subset the product. Or you can subset uh, uh, by pixel coordinate or geo coordinates. In this case, we use pixel coordinate from pixel 2000 and from pixel 8000 for Y to 5000 and 9000. There is the possibility also to resize the number of the bands of your product. Select one. In this case, I'm going to select all the bands of Sentinel-2 plus some additional bands. Quality areas, optical thickness, water vapor, and zenith and azimuth mean. Sun Zenith, Sun Azimuth. Okay. This is our subset. As done before, we click on with the right button of the mouse on the product, open RGB image window. With the new uh, coordinate reference system, Geographic Latlon, it's possible to export the image for Google Earth as KMZ. So right click on the image and export view as Google Earth KMZ. Now I'm going to show you how to use a Bedmat tool. So select the last product generated raster bandmat we are going to create the ndvi we unselect virtual and edit expression The NDVI is defined as near infrared minus red band divided by near infrared plus red band. Okay. This is our NDVI. 
and this band has been attached to the product here. Here we have our band. Using the color manipulation tool, we can stretch the histogram between zero and one. And we can change the color. We put green for the maximum, orange for the medium value, and blue for the minimum. Now we are going to split the screen using this button, tile horizontally. And here we have the two images. One the natural color RGB combination and the other the NDVI. We linked even the cursor, so you can observe that over bar soil we have low values of NDVI and over green areas we have high values of NDVI. Now we are going to calculate the Liefer index, the biophysical variables. So we select the product, optical, thematic land processing, biophysical processor, biophysical processor, sentient to a 10 meters. The processing parameters is Liefer index, FAPAR, and FVC. We run, okay, and the new product. It's touched here. We are going to open the Liefer index. Okay. We do the same color manipulation as done for the NDVI. Green for maximum, orange for medium and blue for the minimum. And we can observe that LIFAR index and NDVI are quite, are quite well correlated with each other. So over green area, we can... Over green area, we have high values of NDVI and the LIFAR index. Okay, now I will show you how to build our processing chain using the graph builder. So we select the first product, the original one. Tools, Graph Builder. By default, you have two initial blocks, read and write. Right click on the dashboard and you can add all the modules of SNAP. The first one is the resampling after the reproject, then the subset, and after the band maths. So, we have the raster geometric resample, then the reproject, after subset, Then we have the biophysical variables, biophysical operator, optical, thematic land processing, here. We have the band math to calculate the NDVI. And the, at the end we have the band merge, in order to merge the original bands with the uh, biophysical variables and the, the NDVI band. We connect the graph. So 
So as done before, we have to set up all the parameters. So the resampling is 10 meters. And after we have the reprojection, that is fine as it is. The subset, we select only the first bands. And here the coordinate to subset the image. Biophysical parameters, we are going to calculate all the biophysical variables, bed mat. We use the same expression as done before. Band 8 minus band 4 divided by band 8 plus band 4. Okay. After we have the band merge. And the right block. Uh, I forgot to put the even the subset in the band merge. Okay, now we have all the bands. And the right. You can or run the graph on the single image, or you can save the graph. I already saved here. And use on batch processing. Save this one, okay. Close everything. Tools, batch processing. You can add all your images. See here, I will add directly the zip files. Okay. All the files have been added here. And after you can load your graph. Here it is. So we have all the Sentinel-2 data is input. We have, should be 18, no, 17 files as input. And we have all the blocks of our graph with the parameters that we set up before. Using this tool, it's possible to apply your processing chain on a stack of Sentinel-2 images. It's quite fast and uh, it will help you with though to apply the, the same processing chain at each file. I would like to thank you for your attention and I leave you with Pierre de Fournier. Thanks to Fabrizio, you know how to produce live array index image using the SNAP software. The section three will now focus on the use of a Jupyter notebook to exploit this LAI time series corresponding to the growing season of the maize crop. We will have three steps to follow. The first step corresponds to a quality control process and aim to detect any image of the time series showing outliers or marginal behavior. It allows to remove the suspicious image from the LAI time series before any crop growth analysis. The second step, investigate the respective temporal profile of each corn field of the study area. 
in order to classify their different growing patterns for the given season. Finally, the third step will assess the interfield and the intrafield heterogeneity for the maize crop. All these results are typically very useful for operational crop monitoring at the regional level, or also of great interest for the farmers to improve their agriculture practices. Before starting the analysis with the Jupyter Notebook, the environment has to be set up and the different packages have to be installed to run interactively the Jupyter Notebook. A Jupyter Notebook is an open source web-based computational environment to develop application, to create and share documents that contain live code, processing workflow, and visualization of the results which are displayed within the document. Based on this Jupyter Notebook, you will be able to run this training exercise on your local computer. And later on, you could also modify the code to repeat this exercise from another dataset acquired over your own area of interest. First, to install the environment required to run this Jupyter Notebook, please follow closely the instructions included in the README file or report it at the beginning of the Jupyter Notebook here. As you can see, there are 11 open source libraries that need to be installed to enjoy the interactivity of this notebook. Beyond GeoPanda, the Plotly library provides interactive tools to handle the graph, and the Folium library allows to interact with the visualization of spatial data. To avoid any conflict and bugs, a YML file has been prepared to install all the required packages in an automated manner over a new empty environment. This YML file has been provided separately. Once the YML file has been, uh, has been successfully run, all the packages are expected to be installed successfully. And then you can still, you still have to import all these packages in the environment of the Jupyter Notebook. This is the name of the YM, YML file. And this is the importation of the packages into the Jupyter Notebook. You are all set to start with the importation of the dataset to be used in this notebook. All the Sentinel-2 images has been pre-processed and transformed into LAI index using the SNAP software as explained in the previous section. However, if by accident you don't have access to these Sentinel-2 LAI images, you still may use the so-called backup training data to continue with this Jupyter Notebook. Anyway, you will have to edit one element in this Jupyter Notebook. This is to specify the folder containing this data. Make sure that you specify the work path in order to allow the Jupyter Notebook to find where you put the dataset to be used. 
if the work pass has been set properly, the Jupyter Notebook will find out that it contains 28 images for the red bands, 28 images for the green band, and 28 images for the blue band. We will add also the near-infrared bands here that we will not use in this context. In addition, two shape files are also provided. One corresponds to the delineation of all the fields corresponding to maze in the study area. In addition, another file is provided to define the invariant surface that will be used in the next step. Let's start with the quality control process. Indeed, we want to detect any outlier before the crop growth analysis based on the time series. To do so, we propose to use the invariant target approach. This means that we will look at the time series specifically on invariant targets, which correspond to very stable surface not expected to change along the season. That kind of target can be found in most landscape. In our case, we can look at the landscape and figure out what are the invariant target here. These are surfaces that will not change along the season. A very first one is the airport strip that can be delineated in a QGIS software, for instance, in order to provide the polygon for the analysis. We can also the warehouse airport and more specifically the roof of the warehouse airport, which will be also very stable along the season. In addition, we may look for dark target, which are also invariant, like the central part of a big river. As we do have even green coniferous forest in our area, we can also delineate a polygon corresponding to this forest stand. Finally, it may be good to have a bright surface, and as we can find a query in our area, we will delineate another polygon corresponding to very bare, bright soil. This allows us to rely on five different land cover which are fully invariant or expected to be so. All this polygon has been delineated in a regular GIS software and has been imported in the Jupyter Notebook here. What is important to know is to mention that the quality control process will not be applied on the LAI time series because the quality process will be much more efficient by looking at the surface reflectance, which are very sensitive to the residual atmospheric perturbation, the residual cloud, or the residual haze. Indeed, we want to be as sensitive as possible to these artifacts that we don't want to have in our time series for the analysis. As you know, when we built a, a time series from a full set of imagery, we will have cloud free images like the one displayed here in the natural color composite, the green, the red, green, blue band composite showing all the surface without any cloud, without any shadows. At the opposite, any time series will also include images with cloud cover showing also cloud shadows and maybe hazes. 
indeed, the combination of these cloud cover images and cloud free images will be part of the regular time series. To simplify our process here, we will select only the cl fully cloud-free images for our analysis. However, we have prepared an optional part in the Jupyter Notebook to allow you to deal with this cloud cover image. As you know, Sentucore is the algorithm selected by default to process the Sentinel-2 imagery. Sentucore transform the radiance image into surface reflectance image and provide a set of masks which will be very useful for a time series analysis. Indeed, the Sentucore, in addition to the atmospheric correction and the radiometric calibration, will also classify according to a dozen of classes, the different pixels. These classes will be used as masks to remove from our time series the cloud, the cloud shadows, the snow, and the thin cirrus. As you can see here, all these classes are not usable in the time series. Similarly, the cloud shadow will be masked as well as the defective pixel or the saturated one and the no data pixel. As you can see in the code here, all these numbers allow to use this mask and to keep only the valid value in the time series. Again, in our case, as we don't have any image which are not cloud free, we don't need to apply that in, in, in the time series. Let's have a look at these cloud free images. Here we will use the Folium library to display our surface reflectance in the natural color composite. Actually, we will use separately the different bands which are typically used in the natural composite. This allows us to verify that the red band corresponds to a very bright image in the beginning of the season, which is quite logical because most of the soil are bare and only some parcels are absorbing the red light to do the photosynthesis. This correspond to the meadows, to the permanent meadows, as well as to the winter cereals. The spring crop are corresponding to bare soil, which appear here very, very bright. When we look at the green band, the contrast is a bit less marked, but we can still see these differences. Looking at the blue band, we can see a similar contrast as in the red band, as the chlorophyll and the other pigment are absorbing the blue light as well for the photosynthesis. Based on these images, and we have seen only one of them, we will compute the time series for our invariant target. To do so, we need to select each of the, each polygon corresponding to each invariant target and to compute the mean reflectance value for each depth and each band. This will allow us to look at the variability over time of this invariant target. But before that, we need to count the number of non-valid pixels which are included in the polygons. 
indeed, this non-valid pixel value could influence the mean that we just compute, and we want to check that there is none of them included in the polygon. As you can see here, none on there is there are no zero non-valid non-valid value pixel corresponding to any date uh, out of the 29, 28 uh, image forming the time series. Therefore, this means that we can use the mean we just compute to assess the stability of the invariant target. Let's plot this surface reflectance time series for the different bands. Here is a time series for the blue band for the five different invariant targets. You can see here with the dot, the different value corresponding to the different dates and the green line corresponding to the median value of all these dots. As you can see here, the invariant target corresponding to the evergreen coniferous forest is very, very stable, showing a high value, high reflectance value in the blue band, but very, very stable over time. To assess the stability of this invariant target, and therefore the quality, the consistency of the time series, we have set a threshold of dot zero one reflectance value as a tolerance to deviate from the median. And therefore we add this dot zero one reflectance value to the median to have the upper limit and we subtract dot one zero one value to the median to get the lower limit. As you can see, the water is also a very stable surface, which show no variability over time. When we look at the quarry or at the airport track, we see a much higher variability, which still remain within the interval between the lower limit and the upper limit of our tolerance. When it comes to the warehouse roof, we observe a very stable uh, signal, except for one image, which is the 21st of November, which is getting close to the limit we have set. As, an, as a result, none of these dates seems to be corrupted or suspicious, and therefore they all qualify to be part of the time series. Let's have a look at the grid band now, and we can carry on, carry out the same analysis. And similarly, we can see that the invariant target corresponding to the pine tree and the water are very stable, while the, the three others are much more variable. And similarly, we have a high value for the 21st of November for the warehouse roof, which seems to be a very special date. Indeed, for the airport track, this value seems a bit higher as well. It worth to mention that these intervals are bigger when the reflectance value are much lower than the other invariant target. When it comes to the red bands, we can do the same analysis and see that the pine tree invariant target is still very stable as the water is. But for the three others, the variability is getting bigger and even for the warehouse roof, we have an outlier uh, exceeding the upper limit of our tolerance. This means that this debt could be considered 
as an outlier and could be removed or should be removed for our time series analysis. We say could be removed because we fully understand that this depends on the threshold that we have set to define the interval of the tolerance. But here, as we set the, this tolerance close to the level of the radiometric performance of the instrument, we consider that this debt need to be removed. Therefore, the 21st of November 2020 has been detected as an outlier and removed from the time series. In the following exercise, we will therefore use only 27 images for the time series. Once the quality control is completed, we feel comfortable with our LAI time series and we can go to the crop growth analysis. First, let's visualize the extent of the area of interest, including all the parcels cultivated with maize. We can count this parcel and we can figure out that there are up to 614 parcels cultivated by maize, for maize. We can look at the LAI time series for this area corresponding to this extent. And we can see that when we look at the first date, the date corresponding to the 1st of June, we have very dark value, mostly, with some very bright parcels. The bright parcel correspond to high LAI value. This high LAI value are most probably winter cereal parcels and maybe also some permanent meadows. When we go into the growing season, we get to the 31st of July, and there are many more uh, bright parcels, and uh, uh, some others are getting dark. Indeed, the winter cereal has been harvested, and therefore the LAI has been uh, lower to zero value probably, while the spring crop has been planted in early June and are growing uh, at that level for the LAI. When it comes to late September or mid-September, we have a, a higher value of LAI, which correspond actually to the full development of the spring crop and of course, the harvest of the winter crop. All these values allow us to follow the season as the growing season is very variable according to the different crop calendar. Of course, we have here only three of these LAI values, while there are 27, as you know. Another way to visualize this LAI time series is to build a LAI multi-temporal color composite. Using the same dates, the 1st of June in the red band, the 31st of July in the green band, and the 14th of September in the blue band, we can display an image showing a very contrasted uh, parcel uh, patterns. Indeed, the red, uh, the red parcel are most probably corresponding to the winter cereal, which are fully developed in June, therefore very reddish in June, and uh, will be harvested in July or early August with a very senescent uh, pattern already in the 31st of July and a bare soil on the 14th of September. The parcels, which are of an orange color, are most probably a mixture of the red and the green, which correspond to the spring crops. The spring crop 
has been planted in April or early June, in, in May or early June, and has developed probably to a certain level on the 1st of June, and then are fully developed on the 31st of July, but most probably senescent already by mid-September. Indeed, this 2020 years has been a very, very dry year, uh, providing or impacting the crop very significantly at the end of the season. The blue correspond to maybe very dry uh, parcels, which were planted, but did not successfully develop, and therefore were probably lately so with a different crop. Let's have a look now on the parcel of maize. As mentioned before, there is 614 maize parcel in the area, but for the sake of simplicity and visualization, we will handle only 20% of them here, and we will select 123 parcels for our analysis. They are all displayed here, and we will use them for the time series analysis. First, we need to compute the LAI value at the parcel level for each date of the time series. This will be done through the code display here, and as all the pixels have valid value, we can use all the pixel LAI value to compute the mean LAI for each date of the time series. We will store this into a vector file, and we will store this into a table that we call data frame. These tables are uh, displayed here below, and this table correspond to the 27 dates, and of course, uh, 123 uh, colon correspond to the 123 parcels. These LAI mean value are the information that we want to handle. Of course, it will be much easier to display them in a very systematic way, and therefore we can use this uh, plotly uh, interface to look at the different uh, profile. As you can see here, in dark, in, in black, you have the mean profile corresponding to the mean value for each date of the uh, time series. We can also compute the 25 percentile corresponding to the first quarter of the value of the distribution for each date. And similarly, we can look at the 75 percentile. What you can see here is a very large dispersion of the profile, which depict actually much more than maize parcels. Indeed, before May, it's probably not at all the maize crop which developed this LAI value, but rather the winter uh, cover crop, which are not destroyed before the, uh, the spring. Similarly, after the season, the growing season of maize, some uh, cover crop has been planted right away and develop a new peak of LAI uh, before the end of the year. Therefore, it sounds meaningful to select strictly the growing season corresponding to the growth of the maize. This is the reason why we will start the growing season on the 1st of May, and we will stop the growing season at the end of the curve corresponding here to the 15th of November. Therefore, let's focus specifically on the corn growth cycle. 
we will cut the profile according to this starting and end date, end date of the growing cycle. This allows us to build a new table and to display a new distribution of the parcels. As you can see here, we can see that the percentile and the mean are still available, but we can look also at all the other parcels. Some parcels behave very strangely, as you can see here, and some other behave very uh, expectantly. We can select specific, specific, specifically some parcels. When we click twice, and there is uh, a single parcel which can be displayed. This profile is a typical corn profile with a planting date uh, probably current May, a full development starting in June, reaching the peak by August and the senescence starting during September and then harvesting, uh, harvesting take place uh, at a different time. It could be in November. We can look at other crop and of course, as I mentioned, it was a very dry season. Some maize crop did not develop as expected and this crop seems to correspond to very, very poor uh, patterns. Of course, the crop development seems very low compared to others. We can look at an even better crop uh, with uh, a peak of LAI which is very, very high, like five or six, uh, while other crop have a lower peak and uh, senescence which is earlier, most probably because of the soil water capacity with uh, lower water available for the crop and therefore uh, a reduction of the development of the crop and a shortening of the crop cycle. In the worst case, probably on soil which have a very little water capacity, we will have a, a very small development for this 2020 year. Even worse, some parcel which seems and were declared as corn parcels seems to be actually underdeveloped during the, the May cycle and then probably planted with another crop before the end of the growing season. And as you can see, we can display many of these profiles. Some are very similar. Some are very different. All of them correspond to a different story. What is important here is to be able to interact with a different profile and to understand the behavior of each of these parcels. Once it is done, we would like to, uh, to go beyond this qualitative analysis and to use a quantitative matrix to compare the different temporal profile. To do so, we propose to use the area under the LAI curve, which can be computed by the integration of the area under the curve and provide a single matrix which depicts actually the vegetation productivity. Indeed, this corresponds to the photosynthetic activity and the production of green materials all over the season. Therefore, we will have this computation of the area under the curve, which provide this kind of information for each parcel. We can read here in the table the different value of LAI uh, integrated under the curve. 
we can also display the distribution of the 123 parcels according to their area under the curve. As you can see, there is a very large dispersion between the different parcels and the mean is fit around 15. Furthermore, we could consider that we want to classify all these temporal profile according to quantiles, meaning that we can classify into five categories the different temporal profiles. As we have seen above in the graph, there are many curves which are very low and that we don't want to, to display anymore. Therefore, we will cut the analysis and the display at the percentile 15, considering that below the percentile 15, we are not dealing with maize for this growing cycle. Therefore, we will have five class, one from 15 to 20 percentile, the second one from 40 to 60, and so on. This allow us to define five class corresponding to five quality of growing seasons, five productivity of the vegetation actually. Uh, we will display all these according to the plot using the different color uh, listed here. When it comes to the colors, we can see that, of course, the very, very good growth cycle are displayed in blue here. The green correspond to the, the very good, the good one. The orange correspond to the medium one the yellow one, and so on, till the, the red one. This allows to label the different profile according to this category of quality of growing season. We can join this information into the table, and therefore all the parcels number will have not only the polygon, but also the quality attribute related to the parcels. This can be exported into a shape file to be further explored in a QGIS or a GIS software. In addition, once we have, let's say, carry on the analysis at the regional level for the different Temporal profile of the corn, we may look at the intrafield variability. The intrafield variability is more important for the farmer to assess the, the way he could improve his productivity by tuning according to precision agriculture the different uh, management uh, within the parcels. To do so, actually, we will now look at the different categories that we label just above and pick three parcels for the three extreme category. For the very low, pa very low quality parcels, we will pick three parcels. For the very good quality, good condition, we will pick three parcels. And for the intermediate level, we'll pick three parcels as well. We will compute them and again display them in a way that we can look at the intra parcel variability. This is what we can do here. And as you can see on the right side, the very high quality or very good condition uh, of maize for this 2020 season show these images corresponding to the peak of LAI. Indeed, all these plots has been selected according to the profile of the image of the parcels and selecting the peak LAI to display the corresponding image here. At the peak LAI, this is the maximum development of the vegetation 
we could expect a minimum heterogeneity. This is what we can see when we look at the favorable growing condition for the what we label very high quality parcels. We see that the LAI reach up to five or six value uh, for all the parcels in a rather homogeneous way. When it comes to the medium quality parcels, where the growing cycle was only intermediate, we can see that the LAI value at the peak of the temporal profile are much lower, around four, and actually also show that the, at the border of these parcels, we have mixel or we have impact of uh, the border of the parcels, which reduce the productivity of the vegetation. When we look at this class, these parcels, we could consider that it would be very meaningful to have a buffer around these parcels before we compute the mean LAI value. However, when we look at the other parcels, which are of high quality, it seems that this buffer is not that important. Therefore, depending on the use, depending on what we look at, it may be important and relevant to apply a buffer around the boundaries of each parcel before computing the mean LAI value. When it comes to the very low quality parcels, we see that not only the peak LAI value is much lower, can be below three, but we see also a much higher heterogeneity at the peak LAI value. This heterogeneity, as the one observed here, is probably due to the soil properties, as we can see a gradient, which corresponds probably to different texture or different soil water capacity, which has been very well marked due to the dry condition of the 2020 season. On these parcels, it seems that we have two historical parcels which has been merged into a single one, but because of their previous uh, rotation, they seem to behave differently with a less productive area in the northern part and a more productive in the southern part. What is important is we can move from these parcels to, of course, the profile to better understand how these parcels develop along the season. We took the number uh, and we know that we are looking at the 4,341 4, 4, uh, and we will look to that. Which is a, a blue one and which is this one. Therefore, this is the parcel that we have been looking at. This is a very productive parcel where we can see a very good start of the season, a very high peak of LAI, but most importantly, a very long season. Therefore, the water remain available and the senescence has been very, very low, very slow. We can look at the intermediate parcel which is a 16 and should be in the yellow. And this is the second parcel corresponding to the middle or the intermediate uh, label, where we can see that the, the start of the season has been very similar. The peak of the growing season is not that high, but the senescence has been also much earlier than the other one. Maybe because of the different rainfall regime or maybe due to the soil condition, as I mentioned before. 
the last parcel will be in the uh, in the reddish one, and this is the the heterogeneous parcel that we have looked at, where we have a very contrasted uh, value of LAI, which seems to to have started a bit later with a lower LAI peak value, but most importantly, probably an harvest which took place by mid-September and reduced actually the capacity of crop development over the, uh, the, the late season. What is important is to be able to interact between the temporal profile and the spatial distribution of this LAI value to better understand the reason of this heterogeneity and the reason or the interaction between the crop management and the development of the LAI curve along the season. I hope this introduces you to the way we can interpret from an agricultural point of view the different remote sensing product related to the LAI time series. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Pierre and Fabrizio, for the wonderful presentations and demonstrations. Below is the contact information for Fabrizio Ramuino and Dr. Pierre de Fourny, along with links to the training webpage and ESA's EO for Society website. As a reminder, there will be one homework assignment for all four parts of the training. Answers must be submitted via Google Form. The homework assignment can be accessed from the training page on the RSET website with a due date of May 17th. A certificate of completion will be awarded to those who attend all live webinars and complete the homework assignment by the deadline. You will receive a certificate approximately two months after the completion of the course from Marinas Martin. We will now transition to the question and answer session of today's training. Please enter your questions in the question and answer box, and we will get to them in the order they were received. We will post the question and answer document to the training website by next week. Thank you. We've been getting a lot of terrific questions. So for those that are attending, please do continue to post your questions in the question and answer box. Uh, so why don't we jump right into it? Question number one, do send to correct uh, 2.5 and 2.8 both reduce the spatial resolution, example given each band to 60 meters, if working in command line code without any parameters? How to work with send to core in offline mode? And whoever answered that, please feel free to unmute and you can answer. Fabrizio, would you like to answer this one? Otherwise, I can do it. Yes, the user can define the resolution of the output. Eh? Uh, as you know, there is three special resolution in the Sentinel-2 uh, imagery and uh, you will be able to select your output special resolution using the, the, the option that you can uh, set in, into the send to core uh, software. Great, thank you, Pierre. Uh, question number two looks like it has to do with, uh, from last week, send for stat. So how can I dan download the send for stat application to be able to practice? send for start is currently not available as it is now running on a beta version and will be officially released by early july 2022 therefore today if you want to train the best is to use the send to agree system which can be downloaded from the website which is displayed here and which is available and related to the send for start system send to agree is a predecessor of the send for start system 
Thank you. Question number three, is a Windows operating system compatible, compatible with using Send4Stat? Unfortunately, at this point, Send4Stat can only be installed in CentOS 7, which is a Linux operating system. This is because uh, the CentOS 7 is very stable and very compatible with large-scale processing. And also, this is an open source software like the send for start is. And uh, the intention was to remain in open source system. Maybe in the future, it will be translated in, uh, into a Windows version, but this is not foreseen today. Question four, to use send for start. Stat. Do I need a computer? No, actually, you you don't need a special computer to run send for stat. However, you need to have a compatible uh, computer. I mean, a, a computer which is compatible with the size of the area you want to process and the duration of the season you want to process. Therefore, this is more related to the volume of the data to process than to the software itself. Terrific. Question number five. Can you please explain how the 21st of November 2020 was identified as the outlier during the practical session? Uh, to set uh, an image as an outlier, we have defined uh, a threshold and the red reflectance or one of the invariant that we have select is identified as an outlier is on this date, the red reflectance deviate more than the set threshold, meaning that it deviate more than the median plus a tolerance factor of 0 0.01. We can say that this threshold is rather strict. This is the maximum deviation that we select to reject an image and it is related to the radiometric calibration performance of this sensor. Thank you, Pierre. Question number six, regarding the invariants, aren't the titles shuffled? The reflectance time series seems high for pines and low for water and airport track. I would have expected the opposite. This is an excellent question, and we are currently checking that. This could be the case, but we are not sure yet because this needs to be verified. According to what we have now in our hands, uh, we, we cannot answer strictly this question, but we will do so in a couple of minutes or, or hours. Great, and for whoever asked that question, when we post this to our website next week, uh, we do hope to, uh, to have that answer for you. So question number seven, what should be the interpretation of bright white pixels in the different date composite RGB image. When this is a RGB image, you know that the combination of the colors will provide a, a single combined color. And in this case, the bright pixel correspond to the high value in all the display bands, meaning that the combination of high display value in red, green, and blue channels lead to a white color. The opposite would be a dark color because there would, won't be any red, green, blue, uh, let's say, intensity, and then it would lead to the to the black or the dark color. Terrific. Question number eight: How does LAI provide different or additional information than traditional vegetation indices such as NDVI? The NDVI is correlated to the Livari index. It's not a linear correlation. This is a, this is a cur curvy linear correlation because the NDVI is saturating for high value of biomass, of green, green biomass. Furthermore, NDVI does not correspond to any ground measurement, while the Livari index corresponds to a biophysical variables which can be measured on the ground and which is used in crop growth model or in yield model to estimate, for instance, uh, the vegetation condition or the vegetation stages. 
Wonderful, thank you, Pierre. Question number nine. Along with LAI, which other biophysical parameters can be estimated with SAR? Ah, we did not mention any SAR imagery today. I don't know if the, the question is strictly related to SAR. Let me first reply for optical. For optical imagery, we can derive the FA par, the F cover, and the chlorophyll canopy content in addition to the LAI. These are the four typical biophysical variables that can be retrieved from optical imagery. When it comes to SAR, but this was not introduced today, uh, we can indeed retrieve to some extent the Livari index from the SAR backscattering coefficient as well, but we cannot retrieve the F cover or the FA par from the SAR. Wonderful. Question number 10. In the case of parcels uh, doing agroforestry, how can we compare the productivity versus parcels using open field principles and fertilizers? Of course, when it comes to comparing cropping system, it is very important to, to know what we look at. And for instance, agroforestry will uh, allow trees to be in the, in the field. And therefore, if we want to compare this with open field, we would need to mask out all the trees in the agroforestry system to make sure that we will compare only the crop on both sides, one in the agroforestry system and the other one in the open field system. Therefore, we cannot mix crown cover from a tree with the wheat green biomass. It won't make sense. Okay, question number 11. Is it possible to get LAI from fusion of Sentinel-1 and Sentinel-2? How effective is it in yield prediction? This is a state-of-the-art question. Today, the research tried to fuse the Livari index, which is retrieved from Sentinel-2, typically optical imagery, and the Livari index retrieved from Sentinel-1, from microwave imagery. Today, these are two different time series which cannot be fused easily in a consistent way. However, Sentinel-1, provide the information when we don't have the Sentinel-2 uh, capacity to observe the green biomass. And therefore, it could be very valid to combine them to be able to predict the yield in a cloudy area. Great, and question number 12. The Sentinel MSI level two data require atmosphere correction like using Sen2 core? No, indeed, Sentinel two level two level are already atmospherically correct, meaning that we don't need to apply any additional atmospheric correction for the Sentinel-2 imagery, which is distributed by ESA through the Copernicus Open Up Access, then they are by default processed by the Sen2 core algorithm, which allow to rely, I mean, to provide a surface reflectance value, and therefore no need to be atmospheric correctly, uh, I mean, corrected again. Of course, if you want to apply a different processor for uh, atmospheric correction, then you need to start from the level 1C, the top of atmosphere data, that can be also downloaded from the ESA website. And then you can apply one of these uh, algorithms. It could be Maya, could be Cora, Icor, or Lars. Great. Question 13 refers again to agroforestry systems. So is LAI providing any information 
regarding biomass or shade level for agroforestry systems? LAI refer to the green biomass materials. And therefore, when it comes to agroforestry system, the biomass is also in the woody stem and which is not related at all with the leaf area index. Therefore, this is not safe to rely on leaf area index to estimate the biomass in an agroforestry system. Question 14, how do I set a threshold in order to detect the outliers when checking quality control of the LAI? The threshold need to be aligned with the radiometric calibration performance, meaning that it does not make sense to set a threshold at a lower level than the noise level in the time series. As you know, any instrument provides provide some noise level, and therefore the threshold needs to be upper the regular noise of the instrument. What we want to screen out using this outlier detection is to screen out the residual atmospheric uh, atmospheric perturbation. And of course, this is on the top of the regular instrument noise. And question number 15, <clears throat> what is the significance or advantage of using L1C data if S2A is corrected atmospherically? This is an excellent question. The Sentinel-2 level 2 imagery are already atmospherically corrected, but Sen2 core is a very generic processor. And in some area, it can be not the best or the most appropriate. For instance, in equatorial area, Sen2 core may face some problem with the high water vapor. And at alternative processor may probably better deal with this kind of situation. Therefore, Sen2Core is probably a very good solution in general, but more specific solution may be required in very specific condition. And question number 16, what is the correct tool in SNAP for image to image registration like in Envy? Fabrizio, would you like to reply to that one? Maybe I can read it in SNAP. There is a collocation module under the raster menu, which allows the user to collocate, meaning to co-register uh, two different images. And therefore, it will be the same than like in NV. And question number 17. Do we have to always create a subset of the image in SNAP before doing our analysis? What is the main significance of creating a subset? The subset allow to actually reduce the volume of the data to be handled. And in this case, as this is a training exercise, it doesn't make sense to handle a full tile, meaning 100 by 100 kilometer, a 10 meter resolution, which is typically 600 megabyte and far too heavy to be handled as a time series, having many of them. Therefore, having a subset allow to reduce the volume 
for the exercise. If you want to do it for operational purpose or specific scientific studies, you can, of course, skip the subset step. Terrific. Uh, question number 18. Can we use the LAI, LAI from Sentinel-2 as input for crop simulation models without ground truth? Today, we consider the, that the, the BVNet software, which is often used, is generic and validated enough to be used without ground truth. Of course, this can feed the simulation model, the crop simulation model, but you still need to validate the performance of your crop simulation model. But you don't need to validate the leave array index. And question number 19, when adding irrigation during the growing season, can it be seen like a booster on the normal growing curve? Exactly. If you look at the temporal profile of a liver index, as well as a, on an NDVI profile, you will see that the well-watered uh, fields, or best irrigated field, will have a much faster growing curve reaching higher level of green biomass. And question number 20, can we link the area under the curve to the total yield for a given parcel? Of course, this has to be, uh, let's say, analyzed careful, carefully. But for some crops, like the corn, this is the case. We can consider that the total green biomass will give us a good indicator of the yield of the corn. However, in some specific season, you may have a, a great leaf development with a poor grain filling, which come as a surprise in that kind of situation. Therefore, this needs to be an indicator, not a yield estimate. I do believe we've gotten through all of the questions. So thank you for everybody that did post your question in the question and answer box. Uh, before we wrap up, I would like to hand it over to Dr. DeForney for any closing comments uh, you might have. Thank you, Shin, for your, your, your kind organization and uh, the very good support. We do hope that with this training, you have learned a lot about polarimetry and learned a lot about the exploitation of optical imagery and polarimetry for actual agriculture application. This last session aimed to introduce you to the thematic interpretation of time series. Indeed, to go beyond the data handling and to be able to interpret in an agronomical way, the result that you may get from the Earth observation. And this is probably the, the great challenge of today. The remote sensing reached to a maturity level, which allow the different field to make use of this data using their own knowledge from their own discipline. And I wish you to be able to do so and to make progress as a community to learn how to use at the best the Earth observation data set that we have today. Thank you for your attention.
Dr. Tuforni, thank you so much. Uh, we also want to uh, recognize uh, Fabrizio Ramolino from ISA, uh, as well as Amalia Castro uh, from ISA, who also uh, contributed very much to both uh, parts three and four of this four-part webinar series. So thank you to all the presenters uh, today. We greatly appreciate all the effort you put into making this training such a success. We also wanna thank all of the attendees that uh, joined us today. From wherever you're joining from, uh, thank you so much for, for spending your time to learn uh, about, um, about remote sensing and how we can apply that to crop mapping. I also wanna thank everybody from the RSET team for contributing to this uh, training. And we hope that you will join our listserv to learn about all of our upcoming trainings. So thank you to everybody. We hope you have a wonderful day.